basically say, if it feels good, I'll do it. And someone says, well, why don't you do this? And you say, well, why not? Instead of saying, why not should I do it? You see the difference? Why not? And you just, there's no intentionality. You're just lazy with how you steward this gift of time that God has given you. And so you don't end up building. You end up responding and just doing whatever comes your way. That's apathy. That's laziness. Okay? All right. Tests of time. No plan. No purpose. Here's the fourth thing. Good to the neglect of best. Going back to our key verse. Make the best use of your time. There's a lot of things that are good that aren't the best. All right? Making the best use of your time. All right? Here's some sub points to that. Mary and Martha, you know that story. Martha's out. Martha's uh, just doing all these things in the, in the home. And Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus finally says, Martha, Martha, come. Like your sister. Martha's mad because she's doing all these things. But it's a poor use of her time with Jesus in, in the home. And she, he's not, she's not sitting at his feet. You ever done that? Too busy doing things and not being with Jesus? Need for wisdom. All right? God is a lot smarter than we are. All right? That's the understatement of the day. God is a lot smarter than we are, and we need to get his wisdom to determine how we use our time. And lastly, it's just a lack of discipline to become a slave to your schedule. A slave to your schedule. Okay? All right, that's the test of time. Here's the thing. We often think that we're victims of what's going on in our world. And I'm telling you, it's a volition. It's a choice. You are not a victim of your world. If you right now, are, your time is not being used in, in wise places, it's by choice that you got there. And it's by choice that you're going to get out of that to start living a godly legacy. All right? You're not a victim. It's your choices that got you there. All right? That's important. All right? And if you can admit that you're struggling... In the use of your time and making the best use of it, you're ready then to go forward because we have the answer. And the answer comes in the person of Jesus. How do we leave a godly legacy? We learn from Jesus. All right? This is how we learn. We learn from Jesus. Jesus didn't just teach us by what he said. He also taught us by how he lived. And if we look at his life, he can give us a lot of insight on how best to use our time. Because we're supposed to walk as he walked. All right? And if, get this. If any one person on earth has ever lived, um, was busy, and had plenty to do, it was Jesus Christ. 24-7, he could have been doing things. All right? People, 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 all the time coming to him. There wasn't a sickness he couldn't heal. There wasn't a marriage that he couldn't spend time with to help them. Right? There wasn't a Pharisee that he couldn't go after and rebuke. All right? There wasn't a young convert that he couldn't disciple. But did he do it all? The answer is he did not. He didn't do it all. We need to learn from him how he did it. Because he did it right. All right? And so we got that. We're going to look at that right now. All right. So here's the first thing. Learn from Jesus. The first thing, leaving a godly legacy, is you better have some solitude with the Father. You better get close to Jesus Christ. You can't leave anything that you don't have yourself. All right? So here's the first thing, solitude with the Father. It starts with God in you. Time, let, me, let me just read you something. I don't think I'll read it. I, got, I, I have a somewhere. I don't know where I have it here. 21 times in Scripture, in the, in the uh, Gospels, we see that Jesus got alone to a secluded place. Early, usually early in the morning, sometimes late at night, to meet with the Father. All right? I don't know where you are today, but if you're not getting alone, getting to a quiet, isolated place on a regular basis, all right, I'm telling you, if Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, needed time with his Father in a secluded place, who are we to think that we don't need to sin? All right? If you're going to leave a godly legacy, it starts right here. Time alone. With the word. In worship. I don't know you. You know the spiritual disciplines. I'm not getting into spiritual disciplines talk. 
But you can't get to God, just to comment on that, you can't get to God without the spiritual disciplines. It's been the way of the ages. You need to open up the word. You need to get to him in worship. You need to pray. You need to meditate. Amen. You need to fast. The spiritual disciplines is the key to intimacy with the Father. All right? Get alone. Get time in quiet. He needs to be alone. Away from people. Time for prayer. Time to rest. You need that. All right? And if you've got your schedule right now and your time is so jammed that you don't have time for that, that's where you've got to start. That's where Jesus went. Jesus had power throughout his day, and he was just a man, just like you and I, all right? So he didn't have, like, godly powers in the same way we think. Certainly he had the understanding, but he didn't use his godly powers to do manly things. He relied on his relationship with his father, all right? And the strength that came from him and came from the Holy Spirit to do the work, all right? Don't think that he was a superman. He was a man, 100% man, and 100% God. And he struggled with the exact same things as you are. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, but yet was without sin. He was tired. But where did he get his strength from? His relationship with the Father. Right? And we got to do the same. All right? So that's the first thing. To leave a godly legacy, you've got to have time and intimacy with the Father. All right, second thing. Single-mindedness and mission. All right? We are, I am, so easily distracted. All right? I'm so easily distracted from what I say I believe and what I say I want in my life. All right? I'm double-minded, triple-minded, quadruple-minded oftentimes, and not single-minded. But Jesus was single-minded in his mission. That was one of his strengths. He was able to always focus on the will of God for him, the Father's will for him. Right? We are divided in our hearts and divided in our time, but if we want to leave a godly legacy, we have to grow in our single-mindedness of mission. All right. How did he do it? Here's what he said, the purpose, John 6, 38. He said, I've come down from heaven to do my Father's will. Not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. All right? That was his purpose. He understood that. All right? And nothing got in his way. All right? And his plan, and then ultimately his practice, he could, all three aligned up. His purpose, his plan, and his practice all aligned with that single minded mission that he had. All right? And you could, we could all profess what our mission is. All right? We can all. Be clear what we think that God wants us to do, but then to actually plan it and to put it into practice was the power. All right? And that's what Jesus was able to do. All right? Every act in Jesus' life was filtered through his single minded mission. All right? It, here's the thing sometimes we think when we're talking about time and leading a godly legacy that we have to cut out a bunch of things, okay? And you might have to, but I'm telling you what Jesus did is he made sure whatever he did went to fulfill the mission that he had. So let me tell you, are you bringing God's mission to work with you? Or do you think that's just a time where I can't really do any? Is it a mission? Is it a mission to you when you go watch your son's basketball game and sit on the sidelines? Are you using that best for God? You might say, well, I know what my kids' activities, there's too much, I just got to cut them out. I'm telling you, make a single-minded mission and find out who you need to talk to and start using that time, redeeming the time for the mission that he gave you. Are you walking through life with the mission clearly in your lenses? All right? It wouldn't matter what you're doing with your time and how busy you are if you were always busy at the work of God in your life. All right? See what I'm saying? What the key to leading a legacy is not just cutting all things out and getting the Bible open and sitting with your, your kids at home. That's a good thing. But I'm telling you, we are. We, the reality is we're busy. You're going to be busy. That's the world we live in. But how do you bring the mission of Jesus Christ into each area of your life? If you're going to work and you're not thinking a bit about what Christ wants you to do today, not really looking for opportunities to to pray with people or to bless people, you are missing it. That's what Jesus was able to do. All right? So single-mindedness and mission. Here's the next thing. 
learn from Jesus' selective investment. Jesus made choices that included the word no. Jesus made choices that included the word no. All right? He couldn't do it all. Though he loved them all, he could not serve them all. He could not talk with them all. He could not heal them all. And we never see one bit of him ever being discouraged by that. We don't see discouragement in Jesus Christ, but yet he couldn't get to everyone. Why? Because he made selective investments in the people that were around him, and he couldn't do it all, but he was clear on what his mission was and who he needed to pour it into. Selective investment. All right? He's never overwhelmed. You don't ever see Jesus being overwhelmed with a schedule. All right? The use of his time, he always prioritized his investments. Here's what it looked like. He prioritized the relationship with his father first. Secondly, he had the three, right? James, John, and Peter, all right? Then he had the 12, and then he had the people, all right? For the people, he would stop when he had margin, and he'd minister to them, and, um, but it never compromised the father, the three, and the 12, all right? And oftentimes we feel overwhelmed, like I got to do more, I got to do more, I do more. Well, I'm just telling you, Jesus had 12 people that he primarily poured into. 12, right? And just like it is to get alone with God, who are we to think that we don't need the same thing? If you think that you can invest in 25 people and really make a difference, it's not very likely. So who's your circle? Who's your circle? You want to leave a legacy, you got to make sure that your circle is something that you can minister to. It can't be so big. It has to be selective, just like Jesus was. Right. Who should be in your circle? Who should be in the circle? Tell me. Family. Spouse. Children. Okay. Then what? Co-workers. Maybe some key co-workers. Maybe two or three co-workers. Other brothers. You better have some other brothers that you're investing in. I mean, I have a lot of great relationships, but there's not a lot of people that I'm really pouring into. I've got a few, but I can't do it with everyone. The guys know. I mean, I have relationships with all my guys from my church, but I'm not, like, with them every single moment. I'm not spending, you know, three hours a day with everyone in my church, but I am spending time with my flock leaders, the key guys that oversee other people, and spending time with my, uh, my senior or, uh, adult pastor and my family ministry <coughs> pastor. I'm doing things that I can do. My circle is clear, and I'm selective at that because Jesus was. Right? If you want to lead a legacy, you have to have solitude with the Father, single-mindedness in mission, thirdly, selective investment. Here's the last thing. You have to be selfless in service, because that's what Jesus was. His life wasn't his own. Right? It was about the Father. His time was not his own. His time was not his own. And my time is his to give, God's to give. My time is God's to give, but mine to live, all right? I'm a steward. You are a steward. And God says make the best use of the time. And, it is, and the best use of his time, our time, is to serve others, all right? We ought to battle our own selfishness, but God gives us an example in Jesus. He was serving others. He was filled to be spilled. I love Luke 4. Luke 4, Jesus goes out in the wilderness and um, is tempted by the devil. And he comes back filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. And when he comes back, that was the beginning of his ministry. Until then, this really wasn't a public ministry at all. But when he got filled with the Holy Spirit, he comes back. I love this picture. He goes in the temple. He opens up the scroll and reads about himself and says, I've come. I have come to spread good news to the poor. Right, and to bring back sight to the blind and to set the captives free. He was filled to be spilled for other people. And that's what we're about. Selfless and service. You want to leave a legacy, you've got to grow in your, your willingness to give up yourself for others just like Jesus did. You before me, all right? John 13, everybody remember what that is? 
He's in the upper room. What does he do to show how amazing, what an amazing servant he was in the upper room before he died? He washed the disciples' feet. Are you kidding me? Jesus Christ humbled himself and washed the dirty feet of sinful people. I mean, I'm just, it's crazy, but he was, it was a demonstration of how we're to serve one another. If you want to leave a godly legacy, you've got to be willing to serve others. All right? And then lastly, sacrifice. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He should have came, and the, the New Testament should have been very short. Jesus Christ came to earth, everybody fell flat on their face and worshipped and served him. That's what should have happened. But that's not what happened. He came and he demonstrated how we should live by serving others. All right? That's what I want to share with you. All right? It's about time, guys. How are you spending your time? We went through the things that buy for our time or compete for our time. We need to analyze those and figure out what are the things that have a hold on me. And start to root those out. And then secondly, practically, start to live like Jesus. Get a lot of time with the Father, solitude and alone. You're not going to leave a legacy without it. Your life is in to those. Right? Because that's what God, that's what Christ did. He was very busy, but he was in the will of his Father. Thirdly, what's next is selective investment. You might have to make some choices. Or you might have to add some. Maybe you're not even investing at all. Maybe it's not that you have too many uh, people you're pouring into, but maybe there needs to be some that you are. And then fourthly, selfless and service. You have to grow in your ability to know that you came, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And that's the same thing God put us here, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. All right? That's it. Here's the verse again. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of our time because the days of the are evil, all right? Let me pray for us, and then we'll go to our groups. Father God, thank you that uh, you have given us such a great example of how to leave a legacy through your son, Jesus Christ. God, forgive us for the areas we fall short, and give us strength to change, to repent, and go forward in a newness of life, in a new course, in a new plan, and new action, Lord, that we might begin to build on your foundation things that will last. God, thank you for the reality that we will receive a reward for our good work. But God, it's only that we would, again, turn those gifts and rewards around and lay them at your feet because it's all about you and your great glory. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your instruction to us, God. And we are, we are not without what we need, God. You've given us your son. You've given us your spirit. You've given us one another. God, thank you for this day. God, move us. In Jesus' name we pray. blessed today. Let's go ahead and offer God some praise right now.
sermon series at TBCC uh, that, that we are titling Lessons from the Life of Mordecai. And we throw Esther in just because we're focusing, but we're focusing on Mordecai. And as I was thinking about uh, our time together this week, um, uh, it was, it, the Lord just allowed me to take a, a soft light look at what some of the verses that, that were operating in the life of Mordecai and just try to share a little bit of that with you if you don't mind today. I've got three life lessons that I'd like to share, and then uh, uh, as we talk about next steps, the teaching has just been fabulous today. I, 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 amen? amen? The breakout sessions amen. have just been, yeah, that's, that's where we're giving the Lord some praise, just for bringing us together around some teaching. Uh, but w when we think about the time that, uh, that this book is written around, and I don't, I don't have time to break this out for you, but you get a, you get a feel of, you know the Esther story, you get a, but you get a feel of, of uh, them being on the having broken away from Nebuchadnezzar out of the exile, gone back to their home country. And there's a remnant that's still in Persia under Ahasuerus. And, and as, as you look at this second chapter, I pulled a couple of verses. I want you to focus on uh, three components here. Uh, the teachers, the preachers and teachers have covered this beautifully already. We want to focus in on the three elements of salt, if you will. And, from the standpoint and the practicality of Mordecai's experience, and then and then place them into your life, and think about what should I do next with this? What should I do next with this? You've had those discussions already. The penetrating influence, the purifying influence, and the preserving influence of salt itself. So let me read. Uh, let me read a couple verses for you. Esther chapter two, verse eleven. Now, I just want to lift this out of the episode. And then verses 21 through 23. Uh, verse 11 says, And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. One episode. And then in 21 through 23 it says, And in those days while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chaplains, uh, Big Than and Teresh, of those <clears throat> which kept the door were wroth and sought to lay hands on the king, uh, Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it to Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Uh, therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of Chronicles before the king. Let me just give you this life lesson here, and then let's, let's I'll try to take about five minutes around into these. And, and lay a high level, some, uh, high level uh, exposition. Uh, first life lesson is this: when when God strategically uh, places salty believers, He empowers us to have penetrating influence for Christ. When God strategically places us, when and where He strategically places us, He always empowers us to have a penetrating influence. That he's designed them. That's really where I'm coming. You say, how do you get that? How do you get that out of that text? Let's let's think about Mordecai being a Jew in a Persian setting, and ask ourselves a question: How in the world does he get first and foremost to be sitting at the gate of the king? How does he find himself in a position where he's a gatekeeper and he's and the traffic going in and out of the king's palace goes by him? How does he have the How does he have the uh, the, the ability to see what's happening? in the courts and have some minor influence on it as it goes in and out, unless God has, has positioned him and placed him in the setting. 
How does he hear about the fact that Vashti has now been, has now lost her queenship, and that he can, and that, uh, uh, and that uh, Esther needs to go and and be a part and can be a part of the the, uh, the maidens that are now processing in front of them, unless God has first and foremost prepared him and positioned him to be in a place where he has an ear to hear what's taking place. Maybe somewhere in the process of this, God is not only placing him, but it's a part of his very plan that he might have some salt-like influence in the place that God has placed him. And so when you find in this text, as you find him, when they're parading the, the virgins in front of the king to decide, for the king to decide who's going to replace Vashti, uh, uh, Esther is there. And as Mordecai is now the, the, the father who's taking the place of her fallen father, in the life of Esther, he is watching over the, the person that he's now groomed and sold into on the behalf of the Lord. He now feels a sense that there is purpose in planning taking place here, and God has placed him there for just a time as this. And then there's an episode here where it talks about from his very vocation, he has an opportunity to provide a blessing into the life of the king. There are two in the court.